Hi everyone, I am here with a Bible lesson. This one is called Equal Through His Eyes of Love by Rose Marine. I want to show you the picture on the front. This girl is really upset, you can see. She's really upset, she's frustrated. She's depressed, she's going through a lot. She doesn't know what to do with her life. Let's find out why. Crack. A cheaper crystallized form of cocaine was developed during the cocaine boom with the American crack epidemic during in major city, surging in major cities across the United States in the early 1980s. Hey, that's when I was born. To the mid-1990s. Despite increased police presence and commercials urging people just say no, the war on drugs was difficult to win. Still today in 2020, it is as well. And here we go. I know, as I was one of the casualties, after my father's death, I was left to try to cope with my mother's depression, which resulted in her spiraling drug use. Eventually, she started to sell drugs to support her habit. As she depleted the life insurance, we moved to cheaper areas until we ended up in a place that was little more than a shack. In the new town, I played alone even on the wrong side of the tracks, the other mothers, the other mothers had warned their kids to stay away from our house. No one would have believed how normal we once were. And while I was too young to understand the stri strange hole of addiction, all I really knew that I had gone from being a cherished daughter to an afterthought. That's sad. There's so many kids out there like that. So many of their parents are on drugs. One afternoon, a well-dressed woman knocked on our front door and asked if I would like to attend a summer day camp. After yelling that we couldn't afford it, my mother slammed the door in her face. The woman came back the next week and this time explained that it didn't cost anything and if there were any expenses, she'd pay for them herself. Much to my surprise, my mother agreed to let me go at vacation Bible camp, which her mother probably would not let her go if she knew that, and later you'll find out why. At vacation Bible camp, I was transported to the land of milk and honey. As we all learned about the Ten Commandments, the soft-spoken lady, who was one of my teachers, told everyone I was her new friend, so none of the kids were mean to me. Soon I was playing the games, gobbling up the snacks, creating crafts and quickly learning new songs. The lyrics were much different from what my mother played at home. Can you imagine? My favorite was a song that emphasized that the King of Kings loved all the children on earth. Can you guess what song that is? Jesus loves the little children. According to the singers, one skin color didn't matter. This viewpoint contrasted the only religious ideology my mother ever shared, this is what I was talking about, which was that the white man's God had no place in our lives. The final day, the gentle lady asked my mother if we'd like to attend church but my mother decreed we were moving again. Seeing the tears in my eyes, the woman asked me to try to remember the two verses we learned in addition to the commandments. As she left, she promised to keep praying for me. I repeated the verses for the remainder of the summer, knowing that it was the truth and important. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ. Jesus, Galatians 3.28, and for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, 
that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. John 3.16 So thereafter we moved again. Soon thereafter we moved again. I was midway through the school year when my mother committed a crime that landed her in prison for 10 years. I was placed in foster care for the rest of my childhood, not leaving the system until I turned 17, which was the same year that my mother was released from prison. I didn't think they let him out till I was 18, but they let her out when she was 17. And not to live with her mom either, you'll see. Isn't that weird? Listen. She still wouldn't stop taking drugs, so I had a choice to make. Try to make a home with her or to go down a different path. Although it had been 120 months since I had heard the simple gospel message, I knew I wanted that truth in my life. See, if you just plant that little seed to somebody, just that little seed of faith about Jesus, you don't know what that'll mean to somebody. This girl's mom told her Jesus had no place in their lives and didn't teach her nothing about Jesus. She went to a day camp for a, few, for a little while during the summer and had a nice lady teach her about Jesus and then went back home and went through all this stuff with drugs with her mother and going back through foster care and all this stuff and remembered it and then had Jesus in her life for the rest of her life. And her kids will as well. You'll we'll see. You'll we'll see. Although it had been 120 months since I had heard the simple gospel message, I knew I wanted that truth in my life. I let my mother know that I loved her and would help her as much as I could, but I decided to follow Jesus. My mother died an overdose, with an overdose three years later. And although I was sad, I never regretted making the decision to become a believer. The Bible tells us of Peter, who received a vision from the Lord, where he was instructed to choose an animal to kill and eat. His problem was that the animals presented both clean and unclean in the laws given in Leviticus. The Israelites were forbidden to eat animals God defined as unclean. So Peter, a law-abiding Jew, refused. During that time, God had also called Cornelius, a Roman Gentile, to follow him. Peter's vision ended with a clear warning to not think that God encourages prejudice, as the voice that spoke to him a second time said, Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. Acts 10, 15. He obeyed and later stayed in the home of Cornelius, which broke every Jewish social restriction of the time since Jews were not supposed to associate with Gentiles. God broke through Peter's religious baggage to have him invite a spirit-filled spokesman to take the gospel to outcasts in the same way in my life. A servant of the Lord ignored those who thought her actions of crossing race lines and economic barriers foolish. In not limiting herself to what kind of child might accept the gospel message, she changed my life. It takes the courage of the Holy Spirit to look at someone different and truly see that they too are made in the image of God. As for me, I am eternally grateful that someone did. And that was her story. Isn't that a beautiful story? Just plant that little seed of faith, that little seed of Jesus, and you can see how much, like I tell you, can change someone's life, guys. Just that little seed. That's why practicing those verses, because you never know. All right, and here's another story for you. Can you check the time? Sure, I'm just going to check the time real quick. You see, this one's by Julie Davenport, and it is called The Prejudice Point. You good? Okay. 
You, part Indian, my boyfriend's father grunted when he met me. Well, yes, I answered proudly. I was raised white, but my high cheekbones, dark skin, and long dark braids gave that part of my family heritage away. I later learned that in his eyes, being even part Native American was a big strike against me. It's probably a good thing that relationship didn't go very far. One of the sorrows of my life is that I do not have a specific or interesting ethnic heritage. Too many nationalities are blended in my blood. I've always been jealous of those who have cultural festivals to jump into. Between my longing for cultural connection and being a Christ follower from a young age, I've been more fascinated than disparaging of different races. So does that mean I'm not prejudiced or prejudiced or I wish, although I may find it easy to accept those who are different from me, I can't get, I can't let them get self-satisfied yet. I can't be unsatisfied. I learned in the past few years that I do have to fight. I do have to fight the sin of bias. For instance, I realized I'm pretty biased against young women at the office, you know the cute young ones who tend to get more opportunities than the middle-aged women like me? Or how many times in our world have I seen a man get better salaries for less intensive work than a female? Or how about those people who have had opportunities for wealth? Those are the prejudices that make me cross the road instead of reaching out, building relationships. For Peter in Acts 10, the dividing line between acceptance and shunning was because Cornelius was a Gentile. But when the Holy Spirit captured Peter's attention, Peter was willing to follow the Holy Spirit's direction and embrace those he'd previously avoided because Jews were not supposed to associate with Gentiles. But God stopped that. What is your prejudice point? Will you have the courage to ask the Holy Spirit to open your eyes and then to follow his direction? Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm going to walk across the office and get to know one of the cute young ones and see what she has to teach me about Jesus. And I might even ask a male administrative assistant to teach me a couple of Excel tips. That's what she says, and there's her picture. I had a friend who was Indian or part Indian. I thought she was beautiful. She passed away, cancer. But I thought she was beautiful and she had the long black hair. Loved it. Loved it. I'd love to have it and be part Indian. I was jealous. <laughs> and the last one, I just want to read this to you beyond standard, arms wide open, and then I'll be done. We chop the world up in illegitimate ways. We meet up with a person or a place or a thing or an idea and immediately we stack it in one of two categories. Things I like or things I don't like or things that are like me, things that are unlike me. So we'll create these two piles, a pile of good stuff, which of course we think is all the stuff we subscribe to then there's this other stuff over here that we then demonize and call the negative and try to eliminate. We want to blow it up. Jesus had this crazy way of undermining that whole deal. Anyway, you could chop up the whole world in the first century. Palestine, Jews and Greeks, men and women, clean and unclean. Jesus would go buddy up with the wrong side. He would touch them. He would eat with them. He would, and people would get so mad. He would befriend them. So you start to get a sense, especially over a wide sweep of the Gospels, that perfection for Jesus was not the division and then elimination of the negative. He lived his life like a person with his arms wide open. Yes, he did. 
not like someone who's making fists. Perfection for Jesus was not eliminating the negative, but redeeming it. Somehow, resurrecting it, bringing new life to it, he's about redemption. Amen. Yes, he was. Just like when he helped the Samaritan girl, remember? He went and talked to her. You weren't, Jews weren't supposed to do that. And Jesus helped and talked to everybody. All right, guys. Well, I will stop there with the Bible lesson. That was our first standard Bible lesson. And I have a few more for you. And then when we're done with them, we'll be done with them. Unless I get any more. I just had a friend give these to me. And I'm not sure if she's going to get any more or not. But if not, then we won't have any more. But if we do, I'll let you guys know. But I do have a few more left. So we'll have them for a few more days. Let me know if you guys like these or not. I thought it was a pretty good story. But I hope you guys enjoyed the Bible lesson. I hope you guys have a great rest of your night. Let's bring those souls to Jesus and God willing. I hope you guys have a great night's sleep. Good night, guys.